I want to welcome everyone to another session in our Women Lead webinar series brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Michelle Burquist, your host today, and we are delighted to bring yet another informative webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Our Women Lead webinars are designed for you, the professional leader in business, whether you are an aspiring woman leader or a female who leads people or projects, teams, or even a company or business. Our goal is to select topics and themes that support your goal to lead, achieve, and succeed more effectively in business. Our webinars are just shy of one hour, and at the half hour mark, we'll be answering any questions that you've submitted online during the presentation portion of our webinar. I'm delighted to say that the focus of our webinar today is communication that converts. And I don't know if you knew this, but employees who love coming to work and customers who love working with you are much more engaged and you can have a much profitable, more profitable culture. So I'm excited to introduce our lovely webinar leader today and our thought leader. And for those of you that don't know Maria Keckler, my goodness, you should. <laughs> She is a bridge builder. She is an amazing woman and thought leader and expert. But here's a little bit about Maria, is that she is an unlikely communication expert who began learning English at 16 years old. Maria has developed a reputation as a bridge builder and catalyst of movements. She's the founder of Superb Communication and best-selling author of Bridge Builders, How Superb Communicators Get What They Want. I have personally read the book, given it out as gifts, and it's amazing, so y'all need to get it. Her work is grounded in more than 20 years of research in the fields of strategic communications, neuroscience, storytelling, and human interaction. She's regularly rated as one of the most inspiring speakers we've, we've ever had, as well as one of the most inspiring people. Note that. That's my add-on. Most recently, she was a featured speaker at Inbound 17 alongside rock stars like Michelle Obama, what? Renee Brown, John Cena, and many others. So please welcome, welcome, welcome our thought leader, Maria Keckler. And Maria, say hello to all of our attendees. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. I am absolutely delighted to be here today. And I have to say that after listening to that glowing introduction from Michelle, <laughs> or if you have met me before, or maybe if I remind you of uh, some employee that you didn't like, you may already have a story that you have running in the back of your head. And if you hold on to that story, whether it's good or bad or indifferent throughout the rest of our 30 minutes uh, that I will be speaking, you can potentially miss or dismiss something that can truly change what you can do to engage your employees. And so what I always like to say is put all that story aside. I'm not asking you to dismiss it, but just, you know, kind of put it aside and then come to, to, the, to the conversation with a fresh new perspective. And one of the other things that I like to do, whether I am working with um, you know, individuals or with teams, is think of this presentation as a spattering of ideas that can potentially be really, really exciting for you. But the truth is that you cannot implement everything. So you're going to have this canvas. And if you have a piece of paper where you're taking notes, I'm going to ask you to just grab a clean piece of paper, put a circle in the middle. And your goal at the end of our conversation is to land one or two nuggets that you will commit to implementing right away because that's the only way that we can truly make a difference instead of having a notebook full of notes. So if you are game, I would love to start this conversation. Every single thing that I will share with you today is really, again, adding to the story of your company or can potentially add it. And the reason I say that is because truly the stories that we believe win. You have stories about your employees. You have stories about whether they are motivated or not motivated, whether they are the right person for the company or not. You have stories about customers, whether they will buy your products or not, whether they are satisfied or not. And no matter what the stories are, whether they're true or not, they win. And that is a key, key component of today's conversation. 
a key component of communication that converts. So let me give you a little bit of the rest of the story and the perspective that has informed a lot of the work that I do today. So um, I started out in this country, as Michelle said, at 16 years old, not speaking English, working at a sweatshop in Los Angeles Garment District. I was just this young, insecure, not confident girl, and that's the only job that I thought it was possible for me. If you have heard a talk that I did for uh, Sue Talks, which is part of the organization um, of Connected Women of Influence, you heard that story. But the, the one nugget that I want to pull out of that is that that story, which is unique to me, has informed my leadership, just as the stories that you have overcome or that you have gone through inform your own leadership. The one thing that I learned while working at a sweatshop is that sweatshops are really nothing more than, than classrooms that can teach us something. They're not meant to be final destinations. They really are places where we get stuck places where we uh, are not, you know, living our best, we are not engaged in life, you know, we kind of have settled for something. Now, you probably have your own sweatshop stories, because we all get stuck in life, we all get stuck as leaders. And the one thing that has made such a difference not only when I was finally able to leave the sweatshop, but since then, and the way that I lead now is remembering one one key phrase that my dad used to teach me when we were playing chess, he would say, Maria, just don't quit yet. Even though you've lost most of your pieces, one pivot move can actually change the momentum of the game. And he would reach over and he would show me moving one little piece. I was back in the game. Now, the reason this is such an incredible nugget that has really changed the momentum of my life is because what I like to do when I talk to people like you is to challenge you to think about what does momentum look like for you? Like if you were to start 2018, the next year with unstoppable momentum, what would that look like? Would you have a more engaged culture at work? Would you have improved relationships? Maybe you would have a team that gets behind your ideas so that you can reach more markets. I don't know what that looks like for you, but it's a great idea to begin engaging this question for yourself and asking, if I had unstoppable momentum, what would that look like tangibly for my organization? And then once you know that, then here's the good news. The how is not that hard. And what I love about this is that communication is really at the core of the way to get this momentum going. So if you forget everything that I say, today, I'm going to give you a way that is literally revolutionizing how companies today are changing the momentum of their game. So here it goes. To change the momentum of the game, what we need to learn how to do is to bridge the story gaps, to bridge the story gaps. Now, you may be thinking, what in the world is bridging story gaps? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to talk to you about. In fact, in the next few minutes, what I want to do is just cover two key things. I'm going to share with you the epiphany bridge solution. What does that really mean when you are interacting with other people? What does it mean when you are interacting with people in your home, not only in your office? And then the epiphany bridges or stories that every leader must be able to build in order to move people to action, in order to influence people around you to really rally behind the vision that you have. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, I want to agree on a common definition for story because story is really at the core of what we're talking about. An epiphany is really nothing more than a story. So here's one that I like to use, and that is a character that wants something and must overcome obstacles to get it. Now, think about that. If you think of every single story that you have ever come across, you pretty much you know, have a character, and a character can be a person, but it can also be a product, it can be a company that wants something and must overcome great obstacles in order to achieve 
what the objective is. Now, we love stories, and we know that whether you know, you're watching Wonder Woman or Rocky or any of your favorite movies, there's always a character that has to overcome tremendous odds. And if this story didn't have a villain or if it didn't have an obstacle or problems, we would actually walk away from the movie. We would close the book. We would walk away from the theater. There, we are actually hardwired. Our brain is hardwired to understand and connect through story. So we love the idea of overcoming that villain and to overcoming those challenges. So why is it that when we face those challenges at work or with the people that we work with, we oftentimes don't really see those stories as just any of the stories that we love. So I wanna challenge you with the idea that you, if you have challenges today, if you're facing employee problems, customer problems, company problems, cash flow problems, whatever the problem is, you know, you're part of a very exciting story. It's exciting because you get to overcome the challenges and get to the other side. So let me give you a perspective of how you, you know, kind of bring it home at your company. So if you think of your company or your boss or the leader of your company, you know, there's always an aspiration, right? The goal that that person wants to achieve. And then on the other side of the obstacle is like, yay, we have more market share or more customers or more revenue, more cash flow. Okay. We must overcome that wall or that obstacle in order to get to those objectives. Okay, that wall, like again, like I said, could be, you know, maybe conflict or, you know, maybe your employees don't know how to present their ideas clearly, you name it. Now, on the other side, you have those same employees or your stakeholders who also have their own storyline. They have an aspiration. They want to achieve that aspiration. They're obstacles. In their mind, especially if you are a company that employs a lot of millennials, for example, you have some challenges there because uh, their aspiration is very different than the aspiration of the boomer generation. They are not living to work, they're just really working to live, to have fun, to enjoy life. And so there, when you are looking at both stories together, there may be some misalignment between those two stories. And so the, the, the most important thing that as leaders that we can do is really understand that each person has an aspiration, they have a desire, and they ultimately want to have success at the other side. And the person who is able to bridge those gaps between the two stories wins. That person is gonna be the hero of the company, is going to be the persuasive communicator, the leader that is gonna move people in the same direction. So let me give you an example. If you not understand the storyline that we all face, then when that first obstacle, that boulder, that wall comes up, it should not be a surprise. Um, one of the first walls that comes up when you have new employees or new clients for all that matters is the end of the honeymoon stage. Every time that you enter into a relationship with somebody, you see the relationship with rose color glasses. Everything is great. Everything is amazing. We're going to just be happily ever after together. But guess what? The honeymoon stage ends. And at that point, either somebody's upset or uh, maybe uh, a dissatisfied customer or a disengaged employee, whatever it may be. Your job is to create an epiphany moment. An epif epiphany moment is this aha moment where everybody remembers, oh my gosh, guess what? That's right. We love each other. We want to be in business together. We want to be in this relationship. How do we do that? We do that by remembering and reminding each other why we are doing what we're doing in the first place. If you're able to create this epiphany stories, guess what? You are going to move past that obstacle until, of course, the next obstacle comes up, which we know happens because we're human and communication challenges are always going to be there. But when we learn that really our job as leaders is simply this, to create amazing epiphany moments, not only for ourselves, but also 
for everybody else. So today I want to show you five epiphany bridges that normally every leader needs to be able to build. So when I work with companies, these are the five bridges that we work very closely to make sure everybody is able to get through. So celebration, confidence 2.0, clarity, creativity, and commitment. Now, obviously, I would have to talk incredibly fast and you wouldn't get much out of this presentation if I covered each and every one of them. And so what I want to do is I just want to give you a kind of a high level overview of two of those bridges, because these, if you can do something immediately engaging these two bridges, you are going to be ahead of the game. And then at the end, I'll give you uh, some information on how you can get uh, more information if you want. Uh, so let's talk about celebration. Now, right now, you could, don't do it right now, but you could literally Google the science on gratitude celebration, and you're gonna find amazing studies and results that show that companies and individuals that regularly engage in celebration or gratitude, they go further faster. And there are literally 50 ways that you can implement celebration strategies into your company. You can do that for yourself every morning. Uh, Michelle and I were just talking about having kind of a miracle morning where you start with gratitude, but you can also bring that to the organization. Now, what I want to talk, what I want to share with you is a quick little uh, video because there's a type of celebration that we often forget about. And so rather than me telling you about it, I want to uh, have one rock star of a woman tell you how she has built one of the fastest growing companies in the world through celebration. So Sarah Blake, Blakely, the uh, first youngest, the first and youngest self-made millionaire, billionaire with a B, uh, who is the creator of Spanx. So listen up. All right. Well, I don't know if you, hopefully you were able to hear the information. Uh, I was not able to actually hear the sound on my side of the, um, of the room, but hopefully you did. If not, thank goodness, there are subtitles and you were able to capture that. But celebration, as you know, just kind of want to punctuate that piece, is not only celebrating the good stuff, but also celebrating the failures, the oops, what Sarah is talking about. And when we are able to celebrate both the good and the bad, people relax. People feel like it's okay to try new things. It's okay to be creative. It's okay to be innovative, even if we don't nail it every single time. And when you are the leader, that is able to really bridge the gap between people being afraid to fail and giving them permission to celebrate uh, the, the good and the oops, then you really begin to move the needle. It is amazing when you give someone a high five for trying, even if it didn't work. I've seen it happen and it can immediately change the tone of the culture. So give it a try. If, if that's the one thing that you pick for today, I would love to hear how that works for you. 
So let's move on to the next one, which is Confidence 2.0, which is the one topic that I'm doing a lot of research uh, about today. So let me tell you what Confidence 2.0 is all about. We know, and you have heard, that what got you here won't get you where you need to go or where you want to go. Now, we all, as powerful self-motivated women, we are confident women or we have experienced confidence. Our confidence oftentimes comes from our degrees, from our certifications, from our work experience, maybe from our title, from the connections that we have, from the work that we have been able to do. But here's the problem. Sooner or later, whether it's us or our employees or our customers, we are going to bump against something that is going to shake up that confidence. And what happens, and this is my experience, that when that confidence shake is, is shaken, we begin to arm up with this fake confidence. We fake it till we make it. The challenge with that is that it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. We are going to burn out if we are just trying to pretend that we're confident. And so what I am here to tell you, and if you are able to embrace today and you are able to help those who you lead or your customers embrace this because you model it, you are going to see incredible shift and movement because most people are not embracing this. And, I, and the new confidence is humility. Humility is the new confidence, is the confidence 2.0. What is that? Being able to show up, being able to say, I don't know what I don't know, so I want to listen. I may not have paid attention before, so I want to listen now. Being able to be fully present to see what we can learn from somebody else. L literally doing what I call lab before lecture. Being willing to bring the team together and putting their ideas on the wall so they don't forget about them, but then listening to each other so that we can truly come up with solutions, with innovative ideas, with things that can really re revolutionize our organizations. So here's what I do when I do one of these strategy labs before we go on to the lecture, before we tell people what we think or what we're going to do. I help them listen. And you can do this today. I love this Chinese symbol for listening because it literally embodies every part of true, humble, and confident listening. It involves the ears, the eyes, the mind, which is focus, the heart, and king. So if we were to practice this type of listening, it would be listening with our ears, with our eyes, with our mind, with our heart, as if we are in the presence of a king. If you are able to move the needle and help people understand how to listen to each other, how to put aside their preconceptions, their stories that are running in the back of their mind, I am tell telling you magic really happens. It is most crucial than ever to be able to lead in a way that helps our organizations become humble listeners and leaders at the same time, because we are seeing so much division in the world today. I mean, politics, the, the uh, violence that we're seeing on the news every single day. We are in a culture that is not accustomed to listen to each other. The leaders that can lead that way are going to stand out. And I make a prediction that in the next five years, those who are able to really lead with humility and inspire others to do the same are going to be the voices that stand out from the noise, that stand out from the fog of information, marketing, uh, just uh, noise that is out there, and be able to resonate with the people listening on the other side. So when you do this, Here's what happens when you're beginning to use these tools to bridge the gaps that exist between your story and your employee story, or your story and your customer story. You create a sense of epiphany. Aha, yes, we can do this. That leads to clarity, clarity, then purposeful action, and that leads to engagement. So let me uh, share with you a quick little case study uh, of what this looks like. So. Um, this is a uh, story that originated here in San Diego. Uh, Bethany is the new director of community engagement uh, at a very high profile company. Uh, she is disengaged after just a few months in the job. Now her manager 
has hit the peak of her frustration because they spent a lot of resources and time looking for the perfect candidate to come and fill this position. Now, after only a few months, she is already convinced that Bethany is not the right fit, that she was maybe a great interviewer, but not the right fit for the job. Now, when we, when we kind of did this whole lab before lecture session with Bethany and, and her manager, we began to uncover that they actually had more things in common than they initially thought about. Now, Bethany wanted to start going out there and uh, talking to the community leaders to go to the golf courses and, and you know, put out their fillers for donations. Her manager really wanted to, her to understand the culture better. She wanted her to be part of the internal culture before she kind of unleashed her into the community. Well, here is what you, you and your company, I am sure you have a number of tools to uncover a variety of, of pieces of this story. Let me share with you one of the tools that we use. So we use the, uh, the Colby assessment, and the Colby assessment, if you're not familiar with it, it really uncovers a person's instinctive drive. You know, what kicks in when you're not thinking, you know, that kind of instin instinctive action that kicks in when you're just not thinking about it, but you are striving or solving problems. So Bethany, if you look at this, you know, is someone that we would call a quick start. Somebody that is just kind of shoots from the hip. You know, she is not concerned about, you know, the consequences. You know, she just goes for it. And in her mind, it's going to be great. Now, her manager, she is someone that we call a follow through, a person that really looks at the systems, you know, crosses the T's, dots the I's and makes sure, makes sure make sure that everything is absolutely perfect. Now you can clearly see that when we delved into this part of the two stories, we saw that how Bethany and her manager organize information is gonna be very high potential for conflict. And also the way that they deal with uncertainty and risk. Now, the fact that we were able to put this on the table, it was amazing because they were able to say like, oh my goodness, we do have the same vision. We both want to do the same thing, except that we kind of tackle problems in a very different way. That's part of our story. That is actually part of our story. And so here's what happened after we were able to literally clarify the stories and bridge the story gaps. We saw that once they kind of started at zero, cleared the deck, put the stories aside, they were able to really kind of brainstorm and listen, you know, lab before lecture. And then they were able to interpret their own doubts and frustrations. At the same time, we taught them how to clarify, you know, the, the picture by asking clarifying questions. And they learned to value each other and each other's strengths so that they could develop a strategy that could work together and also individually. Now, this is obviously very fast, but this is one of the things that you can begin to do. Get people to talk to each other, uncover the stories, see where everybody's coming from, and use the tools that you have. There are amazing tools out there. Some of them measure personality, like the DISC assessment or uh, Myers-Briggs that measures uh, you know, values and strengths and, and temperament. Whatever tools you use, get the full story so that you're able to really begin to bridge the gaps. Now, there's another case story, which I'm not going to have time to go into detail, but I will be happy to send that to you. In fact, I have a, a resource uh, little page for you just attending this webinar. But here is an example of Karen Hines, who is a business owner, and her business model had changed, and she was very frustrated because she was having a hard time working on her business, but at the same time generating revenue and new customers. And so after we put the, the entire story together for her, both her instincts, her, her temperament, her uh, team, her strategies, in 90 days, she landed five new clients, six figures, unstoppable momentum. This is what happens when we're able to look at the storyline of your business and, and just using communication tools and influence tools move the needle in a way that normally doesn't take a lot of time. So what is, what are all this stuff means for you? I want you to think back how we started. You have some great ideas that you can tap into, but at the end of the day, I want you to pick one or two that you can put in that circle, that you can say, I want to put into practice today.
And once you do that, then you can begin moving the needle in the right direction. Now, I know that we're going to get into some questions in just a second, but I want to, I'll leave this slide here because I want to make sure that you get some of these resources. I want to, um, I created a page, Michelle, just for CWI people that attend. I this love it. So that they can get these resources. But here's my last word before we go into the questions. Okay. One move can change the momentum of the game. If your one move is to learn how to bridge the story gaps and to overcome the obstacles, I am telling you, you will change the momentum of the game. You will start the new year with, with unstoppable momentum. So any questions, take it away, Michelle. Wow, that was awesome, Maria. It's like seriously and super fast, I gotta say. We have a lot of questions, but I just love the whole perspective. And might, might I say, what an amazing journey for you to share, you know, with the whole sweatshop thing. I mean, again, for all of our attendees, it's like Maria had a fabulous Sue Talk that she did for us last September. Um, and all of you can look at it on SueTalks.com. So check it out. But awesome on that. One little note before I get into the questions, Maria, um, we did have some people say they couldn't hear the video. And just to clarify, I think if any of you were on the phone, I don't think it came through, but if you were listening to your computer, it should have come through. So that, that sorry about that, but yes, I'm so glad we had the words that came up. So that was a little interesting thing. But here are some questions, Maria. I mean, really fabulous questions. This is the first one, um, and you all laugh, I hope, and have some ideas, but it's pretty much direct. How do I create an engaged employee? Yeah. You know, um, an engaged employee. That one's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously we're not going to answer that in three minutes, but here's the deal, right? Uh, every time that you look at an employee that is disengaged, just, you know, think of whether it's your kid or your husband, it doesn't matter. Anyone that is disengaged, there's a backstory. There's a backstory as of why they're disengaged. And sometimes we try to solve kind of the, we try to treat the symptoms rather than the source. And so what I would say is that before you can uh, put strategies into place or try to come up with a solution or really assign judgment to their behavior, I would highly suggest that you just uh, engage in conversation with that person and just really kind of almost bite your tongue when you're trying to solve the problem you know, say, you know, I just want to hear your story, you know, tell me what you love about working here. Tell me what is, what is not working for you. I really just want to listen. And you will be amazed at what will come out of that conversation that will give you some ideas to proceed. I, you know, that's really good. I think just in line with that, you know, this is what um, another um, one of our attendees, Sarah, shared, Sarah, um, is how do I determine what my employees' aspirations or challenges are? And follow, and then the other part of the question, not sure I can offer this. So it's kind of like two questions, Maria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. big. Yeah, what was the second part, Michelle? So the first one was how do I determine what my employees' aspirations and challenges are? And then the follow-up, or kind of like a secondary question, was not sure I can offer this. I think the first one is, how do you determine what mm -hmm. your employees' aspirations and or challenges are? Mm -hmm. So one of the, my favorite questions, whether I am doing this in a, on a one-on-one -on -one session or I am doing that as a group, I ask the magic wand question. I said, okay, right now, let's just, let's just enter into this world of possibility. If you had a real magic wand in your hand and you could create anything that you want out of your experience here at this company or, or, or what you want to achieve in life, what would it be? And it's some, again, it's really about listening because what it may happen is that at some point you're going to be able to say like, Oh my gosh, we, we do offer that. And you realize that they don't know what they don't know. And then there are going to be some things that have nothing to do with work, but you just enter into the world a little more so that you can actually have empathy for their life and their dreams. And you can be a cheerleader for them. Um, and then there, there are things that are never going to fit kind of really at work, but you, but you just knowing more about that, then you can say, oh my gosh, you know, there's somebody that offers exactly that in the other department, you know, get to know them because, you know, maybe there'll be opportunities for advancement. So 
bottom right. line is really engaging the conversation. I think what I love, Maria, with you is that there's probably, I mean, I'm going to bet here. I'm a betting girl. Just know that. <laughs> I'm a Vegas girl. But I, you know, I don't think there's a, a scenario in business you couldn't answer that would kind of, you know, obviously just bring people together for success, which I, I absolutely love that about you. And, and here's another question, and that is, how do I create epiphany moments? And that's a big one. Um, but maybe you have more suggestions on how to create that. I, I, that's really the only, that's what they said. So yeah. Oops. 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 Sorry about that. Um, Hello, so, phone. Yeah. Well, whose phone was that? Was that my phone? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm uh, not answering. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, I mean, an epiphany is really an aha moment, right? And so I uh, think, first of all, you know, think back at what creates this moment of epiphany, right? And so I'll give you a couple of them. Number one is uh, a lot of the times people feel uh, not valued. And so if I, let's say that Michelle is, um, is someone that I see that is not engaged, I would come up and say, you know, Michelle, hey, let's take a walk. I wanted to tell you that what you did with that project was, I don't know if you realize that, but you really brought it. You have amazing, you know, an amazing gift for communicating ideas, connecting the dots. A lot of the times creating an epiphany is getting people to regain their confidence about their abilities that they bring to work. Sometimes they just assume that they know. And when we highlight those bright spots for them, uh, all of a sudden they have an epiphany like, oh, that's right. I am good at this because believe me, their confidence probably is shaken as well. Another way is um, I share my own story. Like, like uh, Sarah said in the video, I get to share my failures. I get to share, you know, my oops, you know, how I, you know, like, man, you know, I really blew it. And so in the process of me sharing my own uh, failures and mistakes, it creates a, a sense of epiphany for them that, oh, everybody's human. And when you step into this moment of vulnerability, it actually creates epiphanies. Um, you know, listening, <laughs> again, I know I, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but um, listening is one of the greatest tools you will ever have in order to identify how you can create a sense of epiphany because you, as you listen, something will click in your brain that are like, oh my gosh, they think that we don't value them. Oh my gosh. And so you actually get to have an epiphany for yourself first, and then you will know how to create one for the other person. Does that make sense? No, I love that. You know, I mean, I'm going to give a little example here because I know, you know, I've, uh, we've had an increase in our team members and connected women of influence. And, you know, none of our employees and team actually see each other. You know, I mean, we're all virtual. But what's interesting is that I think, you know, with, with new, what I've noticed with some of the new team members is that people kind of tell you what you want to hear initially. And then it takes time to kind of feel like they can really share some of maybe those you know, um, challenges or those things. I don't know if you've experienced that, Maria, but that's been my situation is that I've had to kind of, you know, delve and dig a little bit because I mm -hmm. feel like they're telling me what I want. What, they're telling me what I want, what they think I want to hear and mm -hmm. not really what some of the challenges or things are. But I kind of dig in there, but that, that's what works for me. So I don't mm -hmm. know if you have I'm any so, other suggestions on yeah. getting that, you know, finding out. That's a tough one. Yeah. So one of the, the things that you can do as a follow up question is, you know, once you ask a question and then you hear what they say, then what you can, here's a magic follow up question. What else? <laughs> I know it seems so mm, simple. Doesn't it? That's good. What, what else? Yeah. And then they'll, they'll say something. And then you said, oh, great. And you're maybe you're writing it down. And then you said, what else? What else? You can use what else until they stop talking and they said, that's it. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like magic. I love that. It was like magic. Anything else? Uh, the one That's thing that good. I have to say, you know, I have, you know, my team is growing as well. And so uh, Deb, who I think may be in the, in the audience today. Um, so we call her Deb, the uh, director of fabulousness. And, um, and she is just an awesome new team member that just absolutely loves the work that we're doing here. And so I anticipate the 
the walls that may come up along the way because I have worked enough with people to know that as we get further along in the journey, something may come up like, you know, maybe I am not showing appreciation enough or maybe I am not communicating enough even though I teach communication. And so I, uh, I wrote her a little note the other day and I said, Deb, you must promise that if you ever don't feel loved or appreciated, you will tell me. <laughs> and so even, even kind, of, kind of giving people permission to call you out and to say, okay, Maria, I'm feeling a little bit abused right now. And I know we're doing great work, but I feel like I am just doing, 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 and I don't feel the value for me. And that is okay to do, to anticipate the obstacles and try to overcome them before they even surface. That's pretty good. I love that. But you, you are very ooey gooey on that, that fact. And I like that about you. You know, on that oops thing, um, gosh, really good questions on this one. But here's one you'll love. Oops. Oops. What a concept. I don't work for a company that celebrates this. What can I do? <laughs> That's yeah. a tough one. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you work for a company that doesn't have that culture, sometimes we feel that we can just, you know, hey, you know, whatever, you know, I, this is not going to happen. But it's amazing how much influence you actually have in your tiny little circle. So maybe the company itself does not celebrate that, but maybe you have a small circle of influence where you maybe lead three people and you can do that for them. And so one of the, the things that happened for me, I'll give you a, a great example. I uh, was working before I came to San Diego at Cal Poly where I did my grad work and, um, and they, the, the whole university, I mean, huge university, they did not really embrace, you know, teaching using technology methods. Right. And, um, in, but I was teaching this class, te technical writing for engineers. And I just knew that if I could use some technology methodology, I was going to make them excited about this class. And so I went and I decided that I was going to implement these new uh, discussion boards online and do some things out of the box. Even though there was, this was not a big thing at the time for the university. I'm, I'm gonna tell you that people began to talk about how awesome it was to be in my class and how awesome it was to be able to communicate online. And little by little, I would have not only department heads, but also professors from other departments come to me and say, hey, Maria, can you help us? And when you take initiative to do something you know is valuable, eventually you create a ripple effect. You become the catalyst of that movement. I love the ripple effect concept. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And I think it does. It starts with small steps. Um, you know, something interesting here. Um, we have somebody that works for a lot of, that has a lot of millennial um, employees. And the comment is, I believe the assumptions are true, which this one's tough because I think this one is debatable. But they say, I believe the assumptions are true. They don't seem to want to work hard and put in the effort. Suggestion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because we are definitely seeing a huge influx of millennials in our organizations. Uh, the conference I went to had 21,000 attendees from 100 countries and 85% of them were millennials. So believe me, I've been immersed in millennials wow. and, I, and I bridge gaps between millennials in the workplace and their older counterparts. But here's what I want to say, okay? So we did an exercise, not me, you know, one of my colleagues did an exercise recently. She was uh, uh, working with an organization talking about this very topic. And so before they started talking about millennials, they said, you know, let's put that aside for a second. Let's brainstorm about if you could have had anything you wanted in the workplace when you started your career, what things would you have wanted to have? And as they began to kind of just mention, you know, as they began to put them on the flip chart, all of the things that they mentioned are the things that millennials want today, that they are, the millennials have today. And so the, the, the key takeaway was that we are not that different. We wanted what they have, they just have it. And so, you know, we don't realize that they wanted flex hours, let's say. They wanted, you know, the little beanbags in the in the break room. They want, I mean, all the kind of things that we kind of like, are you kidding me, really? <laughs> Right. But the thing is yeah. <laughs> that we all can have that now. And so when it comes to the work ethic, you know, that I think that, you know, that they really want to work, it's just coming from a different perspective. And so 
I have seen, of course, we always have, you know, those bad apples, of course. But what I have seen is that they actually want to work, except that they don't work in the same rhythm that we work. Like I know this rock star at this uh, corporation that I was at not too long ago, and she gets most creative when she's working, let's say, after three o'clock. And so she'll work from three to two o'clock in the morning. So she actually puts more hours than I would probably put into my business, but her way of working is different. Now, I know that that stuff, when we have to accommodate everybody in our workspaces, but again, we're not going to solve the problem to this moment. But what I would say is this, begin to, if you can put a list of things where you're most, most uh, similar then you can start with that foundation and realize, you know what, we have a lot of similarities. Let's look at the ones that are different. And instead of having an us versus them culture, we can begin to say, how can we bridge our stories? And then create kind of a lab, right, environment where we can maybe even they become part of the, the conversation and solve the challenges that we have, which are legitimate. Love that. You know, I mean, I, and I'll add, you know, I know one of the things for us, because we're all virtual, is, you know, just kind of like getting in there and saying what would make it a great place. I mean, it's amazing what, when you just ask the question, what people want, they'll tell you what they're looking for. And I have to say, as a baby boomer, what was a huge hurdle for us was actually managing a virtual team, because I will call myself very proudly um, an eyeball manager, right? But it's not that way anymore. It's like now we focus in on scorecards, results. It's not the time you put in, it's the results you show us. I don't know if that you mm -hmm. see a lot, Maria, but that was a big change for me and how I manage people. Because in the day when I was in corporate America, it was always about showing up, getting there early, you know, put your nose to the grindstone, stay late. I, I don't, and it's definitely not that way anymore. You know, no. now it's about what you're actually producing. That is a, 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 that is such a great point because even us who maybe come from a more traditional uh, type of environment, we are really not most productive working eight hours straight. We're really not. And so mm -hmm. what I am seeing companies do is to begin to solve those challenges by identifying deliverables, right? What is the deliverable that we're looking for? And what can we measure, you know, that it's, you know, part of the outcome, you know, or part of the delivery from that particular employee. And what you find is that you can have people deliver things in whatever schedule they have that are far superior than if we just have a very, uh, you know, inflexible schedule. So that's just one example, and it doesn't work for everybody, but I just want to tell you that there are companies that are finding solutions and that are growing and they are thriving. And so there's no reason why all of us can't do that. Really good. I know we've um, got a little bit more time. We have a lot of questions still, but you know, for all of our attendees, I'm trying to get to as many as I can here, but this one says um, specifically, how do I know if my, if, okay, hold on. I'm going to reread this specifically. How do I know if my staff is engaged or disengaged? Not sure. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting because you can't quite tell just by looking at them. When, if you look at an employee and that person looks disengaged, that person is already beyond disengaged. That person now is spreading negativity to others. And so there is a continuum oh. of feeling disengaged where you're still, you know, showing up with a smile on your face, but really not being engaged all the way to the far you know, other side of the the spectrum where they already are infecting the culture. And so what I would say is uh, there are ways to measure this. Uh, you know, if you want to do it one-on-one, -on -one, obviously conversations or kind of in a, you know, a focus group. But I, um, with the companies that I work with, we use um, a tool is called engagement um, multiplier and it's basically an assessment and I, and if you're interested, I can give you a free copy to, to use with your team and show you how to use it. Uh, it's amazing because when you allow your employees to provide their opinion, they will tell you amazing things. And it's very humbling, very, very humbling. So you have to kind of arm up with a lot of courage first to hear some of the things that we may not want to hear. Um, but I am telling you that companies that regularly, not just once, 
but regularly survey their employees that they're on a schedule of engagement surveys. Um, they are the, the ones that are able to now implement strategies that move the needle. So, so tap me if you're interested in a free copy of that assessment. Marie, that's great. Maria, this is my question because, you know, I've been out of corporate America for a while and I'm curious with the work that you do, do you find that, and I'm going to make a generality here, so I, I, I don't push back. I'm just asking a question, but do you find that baby boomers are less willing to accept the fact that the way they do things is not perfect or the right way, as opposed to, let's say, our younger counterparts? that are in their 30s or 20s because I'm just kind of I know for me as a manager it's like you know this is the way it is it's like I'm I, I try to be flexible but I'm a baby boomer you know and it's like it's my way and I try to be open to that and I still love that video for Sarah Blakely where she shared about the oops moment because none of us are perfect as leaders how do we embrace more of that be open to the idea that we're not perfect it's not always our way and a different perspective is a good thing. This is my question. How long about that, right? There yeah. were 20 questions in there, I think. <laughs> no, that's a really great question. The first, the first piece of that question is, uh, do I see the boomers being the most, you know, maybe uh, resistant to changing or to listening? Uh, what I would say is no. I actually see it on both sides. Mm. Uh, I, okay. uh, you know, we use Colby as, you know, we're a strategic partner of Colby and we use it for every single one of our clients. In fact, I not even work with somebody that does not have a Colby because he tells us a lot, but here is one of the things that, um, I just heard from Kathy Colby, who is the, the theorist behind this. She says the number one, the number one disability, whether it's a learning disability or, a, or inability to lead well is arrogance. So arrogance is really at the opposite side of humility, right? And so what I see is that, um, unfortunately, uh, millennials do bring a lot of arrogance, not by their own fault, because we created that arrogance by uh, giving them an award for everything, whether they won the game or not, just for showing up. So we actually created a generation of arrogance. However, there's an openness to moving to the other side if they're engaged in conversation. And the most disarming thing that I see happen is when we, and I do this all the time, I said, hey, Michelle, let's go have coffee. All I want is to hear your story. I mean, so disarming because I don't have an agenda. All I want to do is learn about you. And what I am seeing is that both millennials and boomers and everybody in between that are willing to say, you know what, I'm willing to try that, they begin to see things and learn things about the other generation that is really exciting. And so arrogance That's does not discriminate. That's what I would say. Cool. No, I think that's great because you, you're, you're in it, man. I, I know you've got an interesting perspective. You know, we've got a couple more questions that we'll have time for. Um, this one was, uh, let's see here. Uh, what would you suggest and how to rally change and excitement among our division. I think we're stuck in a rut. And then she put AKA lab and lecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I know, I don't know if, you, if this term is familiar to you, but we have this saying is, um, a prophet has no honor in his own country, right? So the idea <laughs> is, that's a little phrase, you know, that I, I, like, I, that. That I use that, right? I like that. That I mean, think about this, right? If you have kids, you tell you have given them amazing wisdom over the years, and then all of a sudden they talk to Michelle and they she says exact same thing, and all of a sudden they come and say, "Oh my gosh, guess what Michelle said?" And you roll your eyes because you have been saying that all along. Well, that's just human nature. That the more familiar people are with us, the less they listen. And so, in answer to that question, is how can you begin to move the needle? Um, what I would say is bring somebody else to say those things. Um, that's one of the reasons I love coming and doing lunch and learns or talks because I may be saying the same thing you're saying, but because I'm the outsider, all of a sudden, oh my gosh, look at what she said. But you are still the hero because you facilitated that conversation. And so I would say model humility by showing what it looks like to ask for help, to bring other people, to bring other experts, to even share these, this webinar with them, um, that would be one way that you can do it. 
Well, and I think the other way is just like what you said. It's like, you know, do the, the you know, sign up for your Bridges to per Personal Breakthrough um, little link here, superbcommunication.com slash CWI, right? So mm -hmm. go there. And um, and then the other thing, I mean, this was just some of the other questions, but a quick one, because I know we're on the downhill slide here for a moment. People that want to get your book, Maria, first of all, it is an awesome book. It is just, I mean, it's all about win-win. So if any of you are thinking, hey, you know, I'm going to win, somebody else is going to lose. This is not the book. It's all about creating win-win. And that's what I love most about your book. Where can people get it? Should they go to your website? Should they go to Amazon? Does it matter? Any suggestions? You know, no, yeah, I mean, you, if you want to just grab a copy, you can go uh, to Amazon and you can either get the Kindle or the hard copy. Uh, if you want to, you know, when I come and speak, I usually, you know, include the book as part of that. And so eat, whatever way that works for you, you know, as long as you read it, it's a story. So stories actually uh, fire up our brain in a special way. So it's a very quick read, but it has some really hard questions at the end of each chapter that you can actually use as a conversation starters. Love it. Love it. And here's our one final question. I love this question. This is a great way to end it. How do I determine my one pivot move? Yes. Okay. Ooh. So, so <laughs> that's okay. That's, that's a great question. Uh, Isn't it? I'm yeah. like, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lucy. <laughs> yeah. so, so the pivot move is a lot about clarity, right? I mean, wouldn't it be great if we just had so much clarity that I just know where to go? I mean, that is the hard thing. So two ways. Number one is I tell people, if you don't know who you are, at least remember who you don't want to become. Because when you know that, mm. then you at least know what move you, then the next move will become clear. So if you don't know who you are or if you don't know what to do, then remember what, who you don't want to become. That is a great clarifier. The second thing is, ha, again, have somebody just listen to you. So we've been talking a lot about listening. Invite somebody to listen to you. You say, you know, hey, I'm, I, I'm, I just want some clarity. Because in the process of you sharing your story with somebody else, they're going to be able to point out things that you didn't see before, or you will have aha moments. And so I always like uh -huh. to say it's hard to look at yourself with your own magnifying glass. So bring somebody else that can listen to you and give you some clarity and lead you into those epiphany moments. I, that's cool. I would say one little caveat on that, you know, uh, don't ask your family. <laughs> oh, oh well, that, that's, that's, yeah. that's the wrong one. You want to ask colleagues or trusted advisors or things like that. Cause I'm like, your family will tell you stuff. You're like, Oh my gosh, that doesn't make, that doesn't well, make any sense. But and not only that, I would say that's a great point, Michelle. I'm so glad that you said that. Don't, don't choose someone that has something to gain or lose by your decision. Because uh, if yeah. they have something to win or lose by the decision that you will make out of that conversation, that's not the right person because they can't be objective. Love it. I'm gonna, I want to leave with one final um, thought. This is no pressure on you, but it kind of is. But leave us with something inspirational, motivational. You are all that, but fabulous job on the webinar. Thank you to all of our attendees. But what can you leave us with that's going to make us go, oh, my God, you're amazing, Maria, which you already have oh done. But what's one more final thought, final oh, okay. thought leadership? Yes, thank no you. No pressure. No, of course, right. So your identity matters. Who you think you are is the most important thing that will determine your leadership. So until you identify, you know, what is the one phrase, this is who I am, I am going to say, adopt mine. I am a bridge builder. My job is to build bridges to people's hearts, to people's minds, to overcome obstacles. So that's one of the things that has changed me to understand that because I am bridge builder, it changes the way I respond when people criticize me. It changes how I overcome obstacles. It changes how I look at the world when I see everything falling apart and people shooting people. And it dictates a, a response. My job is to bridge gaps, not to burn bridges. So if you can start with that, oh my gosh, there's no limit to what you can do. Girl, that was amazing. Here, we're applauding you. Awesome job. Maria, thank you for being our thought leader today. I know we're going to have you back. I hope you'll want to come back. Absolutely. To all of our attendees, 
today. I hope you'll pick up, you know, Maria's offer that she gave us earlier um, to be able to, you know, go online and fill out some information or reach out to her. So this webinar will be available on YouTube here shortly. Um, to all of our attendees, thanks for joining us because we're going to be back every other Monday for another Women Lead webinar series um, for you to lead more effectively in business. So it is Monday. I hope all of you have a great week and we will see you again for the next Women Lead webinar.